Our sermon today is entitled, Pleading. It is number 1018, delivered on Lord's Day morning, October 29, 1871, by Rev. Charles H. Spurgeon, at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in Newington. Our text today is Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Young painters were anxious in olden times to study under the great masters. They concluded that they should be more easily attained to excellence if they entered the schools of eminent men. Men have paid large premiums that their sons may be apprenticed or article to those who best understood their trades or professions. Now, if any of us would learn the sacred art and mystery of prayer, it is well for us to study the productions of the greatest masters of that science. I am unable to point out one who understood it better than did the psalmist David. So well did he know how to praise that his psalms have become the language of good men in all ages. And so well did he understand how to pray that if we catch his spirit and follow his mode of prayer, we shall have learned to plead with God after the most prevalent sort. Place before you, first of all, David's son and David's Lord, that most mighty of all intercessors, and next to him, you shall find David to be one of the most admirable models for your imitation. We shall consider our text, then, as one of the productions of a great master in spiritual matters, and we will study it, praying all the while that God will help us to pray after the like fashion. In our text, we have the soul of a successful pleader under four aspects. We view first the soul confessing, I am poor and needy. You have next the soul pleading, where he makes a plea out of his poor condition and adds, Make haste unto me, O God. You see, thirdly, a soul in its urgency, for he cries, Make haste, and he varies the expression, but keeps the same idea, Make no tarrying. And you have in the fourth and last view, a soul grasping God, for the psalmist puts it thus, Thou art my help and my deliverer. Thus, with both hands, he lays hold upon his God, so as not to let him go, till a blessing is obtained. To begin with, then, we see in this model of supplication a soul confessing. The wrestler strips before he enters upon the contest, and confession does the like for the man who is about to plead with God. A racer on the plains of prayer cannot hope to win, unless, by confession, repentance, and faith, he lays aside every weight of sin. Now let it ever be remembered that confession is absolutely needful to the sinner when he first seeks a Savior. It is not possible for thee, O seeker, to obtain peace for thy troubled heart, till thou shalt have acknowledged thy transgression and thine iniquity before the Lord. Now thou mayest do what thou wilt, I even attempt to believe in Jesus. But thou shalt find that the faith of God's elect is not in thee, unless thou art willing to make a full confession of thy transgression and lay bare thy heart before God. We do not usually think of giving charity to those who do acknowledge that they need it. The physician does not send his medicine to those who are not sick. The blind man in the Gospels had to feel his blindness and to sit by the wayside begging. If he had entertained a doubt as to whether he were blind or not, the Lord would have passed him by. He opens the eyes of those who confess their blindness. But if others, he says, because ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. He asks of those who are brought to him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? In order that their need may be publicly avowed. It must be so with all of us. We must offer the confession, or we cannot gain the benediction. Let me speak especially to you who desire to find peace with God and salvation through the precious blood. You will do well to make your confession before God very frank, very sincere, very explicit. Surely you have nothing to hide. 
For it's not, there is nothing you can hide. He knows your guilt already, but he would have you know it. And therefore he bids you confess it. Go into the details of your sin in your secret acknowledgments before God. Strip yourself of all excuses. Make no apologies. Say, against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Acknowledge the evil of sin. Ask God to make you feel it. Do not treat it as a trifle, for it is none. To redeem the sinner from the effect of sin, Christ himself must needs die. And unless you be delivered from it, you must die eternally. Therefore, play not with sin. Do not confess it as though it were some venial fault, which would not have been noticed unless God had been too severe. But labor to see sin as God sees it, as an offense against all that is good, a rebellion against all that is kind. See it to be treason, to be ingratitude, or be a mean and base thing. Do not think you can improve your condition before God by painting your case in brighter colors than it should be. Blacken it. If it were possible, blacken it. But it is not possible. When you feel your sin most, you have not half felt it. When you confess it most fully, you don't know a tithe of it. But, oh, to the utmost of your ability, make a clean breast of it and say, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Acknowledge the sins of your youth and your manhood, the sins of your body and of your soul, the sins of omission and of commission, sins against the law and offenses against the gospel. Acknowledge all. Neither for a moment seek to deny one portion of the evil with which God's law, your own conscience, and his Holy Spirit justly charge you. An old soul, if thou wouldst get peace and approval with God in prayer, confess the ill desert of thy sin. Submit thyself to do whatever divine justice may sentence thee to endure. Confess that the deepest hell is thy desert. And confess this not with thy lips only, but with thy soul. Let this be the doleful ditty of thine inmost heart. Should sudden vengeance seize my breath, I must pronounce thee just in death. And if my soul were sent to hell, thy righteous law approves it well. If thou wilt condemn thyself, God will acquit thee. If thou wilt put the rope about thy neck and sentence thyself, then he who otherwise would have sentenced thee will say, I forgive thee through the merit of my son. But never expect that the king of heaven will pardon a traitor if he will not confess and forsake his treason. Even the tenderest father expects that his child should humble himself when he is offended and will not withdraw his frown from him till with tears he has said, Father, I have sinned. Darest thou expect God to humble himself to thee? And would it not be so if he did not constrain thee to humble thyself to him? Would thou have him connive at thy faults and wink at thy transgressions? He will have mercy, but he must be holy. He is ready to forgive, but not to tolerate sin. And therefore he cannot let thee be forgiven if thou huggest thy sins, or if thou presumest to say, I have not sinned. Hasten then, O seeker, hasten, I pray thee, to the mercy seat with this upon thy lips. I am poor and needy. I am sinful. I am lost. Have pity on me. With such an acknowledgment thou beginnest thy prayer well, and through Jesus thou shalt prosper in it. Beloved hearers, the same principle applies to the church of God. We are praying for a display of the Holy Spirit's power in this church. And in order to successful pleading in this matter, it is necessary that we should unanimously make the confession of our text, I am poor and needy. We must own that we are powerless in this business. Salvation is of the Lord, and we cannot save a single soul. 
The Spirit of God is treasured up in Christ, and we must seek Him of the great head of the church. We cannot command the Spirit, and yet we can do nothing without Him. He bloweth where He listeth. We must deeply feel and honestly acknowledge this. Will you not heartily assent to it, my brethren and sisters, at this hour? May I not ask you unanimously to renew the confession this morning? We must also acknowledge that we are not worthy that the Holy Spirit should condescend to work with us and by us. There is no fitness in us for his purposes, except he shall give us that fitness. Our sins might well provoke him to leave us. He has striven with us, he has been tender towards us, but he might well go away and say, I will no more shine upon that church and no more bless that ministry. Let us feel our unworthiness. It will be a good preparation for earnest prayer. Remark you, brethren, God will have his church before he blesses it know that the blessing is altogether from himself. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The career of Gideon was a very remarkable one, and it commenced with two most instructive signs. I think our Heavenly Father would have all of us learn the very same lesson which he taught to Gideon, and when we have mastered that lesson, he will use us for his own purposes. Now, you remember Gideon laid a fleece upon the barn floor, and in the morning all round was dry, and the fleece alone was wet. God had alone had saturated the fleece so that he could wring it out. And its moisture was not due to its being placed on in a favorable situation, for all around was dry. He would have us learn that if the dew of his grace fills any one of us with its heavenly moisture, it is not because we lie upon the barn floor of a ministry which God usually blesses, or because we are in a church with the Lord usually graciously visits, but we must be made to see that the visitations of his Spirit are fruits of the Lord's sovereign grace and gifts of his infinite love, and not of the will of man, neither by man. But then the miracle was reversed. For as old Thomas Fuller says, God's miracles will bear to be turned inside out, and look as glorious one way as another. The next night the fleece was dry, and all around was wet. For skeptics might have said, well, yes, but a fleece would naturally attract moisture, and if there were any in the air, it would be likely to be absorbed by the wool. But lo, on this occasion... The dew is not where it might be expected to be, or even though, it, even though it lies thickly all around. Damp is the stone, and dry is the fleece. So God will have us know that he does not give us his grace because of any natural adaptation in us to receive it. And even where he has given a preparedness of heart to receive, he will have us understand that his grace and his spirit are most free in action and sovereign in operation and that he is not bound to work after any rule of our making. If the fleece be wet, he bedews it, and that not because it is a fleece, but because he chooses to do so. He will have all the glory of all his grace from first to last. Come then, my brethren, and become disciples to this truth. Consider that from the great Father of lights, every good and perfect gift must come. We are his workmanship. He must work all our works in us, Isaiah 26, 12. Grace is not to be commanded by our position or condition. The wind bloweth where it listeth. The Lord works, and no man can hinder. But if he works not, the mightiest and most zealous labor is but in vain. It is very significant that before Christ fed the thousands, he made the disciples sum up all their provisions. It was well to let them see how low the commissariat had become. For then, when the crowds were fed, they could not say the basket fed them, nor that the lad had done it. God will make us feel how little are our bar barley loaves, how small are our fishes, and compel us to inquire, what are they among so many? When the Savior bade his disciples cast the net on the right side of the ship, and they dragged such a mighty shoal to land, he did not work the miracle till they had confessed that they had toiled all the night and they had taken nothing. They were thus taught that the success of their fishery was dependent upon the Lord. It was not their net, nor the way of dragging it, nor their skill and art in handling their vessels, but that altogether and entirely their success came from their Lord. We must get down to this, and the sooner we come to it, the better. Before the ancient Jews kept the Passover, 
Observe what they did. The unleavened bread is to be brought in, and the paschal lamb to be eaten. But there shall be no unleavened bread, and no paschal lamb, till they have purged out the old leaven. If you have any old strength and self-confidence, if you have anything that is your own, therefore leavened, it must be swept right out. There must be a bare cupboard before there can come in the heavenly provision upon which the spiritual Passover can be kept. I thank our God when he clears us out. I bless his name when he brings us to feel our soul poverty as a church, for then the blessing will be sure to come. One other illustration will show this perhaps more distinctly still. Behold Elijah with the priests of Baal at Carmel. The test appointed to decide Israel's choice was this. The God that answereth by fire, let him be God. Baal's priests invoke the heavenly flame in vain. Elijah is confident that it will come upon his sacrifice, but he is also sternly resolved that the false priests and the fickle people shall not imagine that he himself had produced the fire. He determines to make it clear that there is no human contrivance, trickery, or maneuver about the matter. The flame should be seen to be of the Lord and of the Lord alone. Remember the stern prophet's command, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. He said do it a second time, and they did it a second time, he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. There could be no latent fire there. If there had been any combustibles or chemicals calculated to produce fire after the manner of the cheats of the, t of the time, they would have all been damped and spoiled. When no one could imagine that man could burn the sacrifice, then the prophet lifted up his eyes to heaven and began to plead, and down came the fire of the Lord, which consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the altar stones and the dust and even licked up the water that was in the trench. Then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, Jehovah is the God, Jehovah is the God. The Lord in this church, if he means greatly to bless us, may send us trial of pouring on the water once and twice and thrice. He may discourage us grieve us, and try us, and bring us low, till all shall see that it is not of the preacher, it is not of the organization, it is not of man, but altogether of God, the Alpha and the Omega, who worketh all things according to the counsel of his will. Thus I have shown you that for a successful season of prayer, the best beginning is confession that we are poor and needy. Secondly, after the soul has unburdened itself of all weights of merit and self-sufficiency, it proceeds to prayer, and we have before us a soul pleading, I am poor and needy, make haste unto me, O God, thou art my help and my deliverer, O Lord, make no tarrying. A careful reader will perceive four pleas in this single verse. Upon this topic, I would remark that it is the habit of faith when she is praying to use pleas. Mere prayer sayers, who do not pray at all, <clears throat> forget to argue with God. But those who would prevail bring forth their reasons and their strong arguments, and they debate the question with the Lord. They who play at wrestling catch here and there at random, but those who are really wrestling have a certain way of grasping the opponent, a certain mode of throwing, and the like. They work according to order and to rule. Faith's art of wrestling is to plead with God and say with holy boldness, Let it be thus and thus, for these reasons. Hosea tells us of Jacob at Shabbat, that there he spake with us, from which I understand that Jacob instructed us by his example. Now the two pleas which Jacob used were God's precept and God's promise. First he said, Thou sayest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, as much as if he put it thus, Lord, I am in difficulty, but I have come here through obedience to thee. Thou didst tell me to come hither, into the very teeth of my brother Esau, who comes to meet me like a lion. Lord, thou canst not be so unfaithful as to bring me into danger and then leave me in it. This was sound reasoning, 
and it prevailed with God. Then Jacob also urged a promise. Thou saidest, I will surely do thee good. Among men, it is a masterly way of reasoning when you can challenge your opponent with his own words. You may quote other authorities, and he may say, I deny their force. But when you quote a man against himself, you foil him completely. When you bring a man's promise to his mind, he must either confess himself to be unfaithful and changeable, or if he holds to being the same and being true to his word, you have it, and you have won your will of him. Oh, brethren, let us learn thus to plead the precepts, the promises, and whatever else may serve our turn. But let us always have something to plead. Do not reckon you have prayed unless you have pleaded, for pleading is the very marrow of prayer. He who pleads well knows the secret of prevailing with God, especially if he pleads the blood of Jesus, for that unlocks the treasury of heaven. Many keys fit many locks, but the master key is the blood and the name of him that died but rose again and ever lives in heaven to save unto the uttermost. Faith's pleas are plentiful, and this is well, for faith is placed in diverse positions and needs them all. She hath many needs, and having a keen eye, she perceives that there are pleas to be urged in every case. I will not therefore tell you all faith's pleas, but I will just mention some of them, enough to let you see how abundant they are. Faith will plead all the attributes of God. Thou art just, therefore spare thou the soul for whom the Savior died. Thou art merciful, blot out my transgressions. Thou art good, reveal thy bounty to thy servant. Thou art immutable, thou hast done this and thus to others of thy servants, do thus unto me. Thou art faithful, canst thou break thy promise, canst thou turn away from thy covenant? Rightly viewed, all the perfections of deity become pleas for faith. Faith will boldly plead all God's gracious relationships. She will say to him, Art thou not the Creator? Wilt thou forsake the work of thine own hands? Art thou not the Redeemer? Thou hast redeemed thy servant, wilt thou cast me away? Faith usually delights to lay hold upon the fatherhood of God. Now this is generally one of her master points. When she brings this into the field, she wins the day. Thou art a father, and wouldst thou chasten us as though thou wouldst kill a father, and thou hast no sympathy and no bowels of compassion? A father, and canst thou deny what thine own child asks of thee? Whenever I am impressed with the divine majesty, and so perhaps a little dispirited in prayer, I find the short and sweet remedy is to remember that although he is a great king and infinitely glorious, I am his child. And no matter who the father is, the child may always be bold with his father. Yes, faith can plead any and all of the relationships in which God stands to his chosen. Faith, too, can ply heaven with the divine promises. If you were to go to one of the banks in Lombard Street and see a man go in and out and lay a piece of paper on the tables and take it up again and nothing more, now if he did that several times a day, I think there would soon be orders issued to the porter to keep the man out because he was merely wasting the clerk's time and doing nothing to purpose. Those city men who come into the bank and in earnest present their checks, they wait till they receive their money, and then they go, but not without having transacted real business. They do not put the paper down, speak about the excellent signature, and discuss the correctness of the document, but they want their money for it, and they are not content without it. Now these are the people who are always welcome at the bank, and not the triflers. Alas, a great many people play at praying. It is nothing better. I say they play at praying. They do not expect God to give them an answer, and thus they are mere triflers who mock the Lord. He who prays in a businesslike way, meaning what he says, honors the Lord. The Lord does not play at promising. Jesus did not sport at confirming the word by his blood. And we must not make a jest of prayer by going about it in a 
listless, unexpecting spirit. The Holy Spirit is in earnest, and we must be in earnest also. We must go for a blessing and not be satisfied till we have it. Like the hunter who is not satisfied because he has run so many miles, but is never content till he takes his prey. Faith, moreover, pleads the performances of God. She looks back on the past and says, Lord, thou didst deliver me on such and such an occasion. Wilt thou fail me now? She, moreover, takes her life as a whole and pleads thus, After so much mercy past, wilt thou let me sink at last? Hast thou brought me so far that I may be put to shame at the end? She knows how to bring the ancient mercies of God and make them arguments for present favors. But your time would be all gone if I tried to exhibit even a thousandth part of faith's pleas. Sometimes, however, Faith's pleas are very singular, as in this text. It is by no means according to the proud rule of human nature to plead, I am poor and needy, make haste unto me, O God. It is like another prayer of David, Have mercy upon mine iniquity, for it is great. It is not the manner of men to plead so. They say, Lord, have mercy on me, for I am not so bad a sinner as some. But faith reads things in a truer light and bases her pleas on truth. Lord, because my sin is great, and thou art a great God, let thy great mercy be magnified in me. You know the story of the one woman who came to Christ about her daughter, and he answered her not a word. What do you think her heart said? Why, she said in herself, It is well, for he has not denied me. Since he has not spoken at all, he has not refused me. With this for an encouragement, she began to plead again. Presently, Christ spoke to her sharply. And then her brave heart said, I have gained words from him at last. I shall have deeds from him by and by. That also cheered her. And then when he called her a dog, ah, she reasoned, but a dog is a part of the family. It has some connection with the master of the house. Though it does not eat meat from the table, it gets the crumbs under it. And so I have thee now, great master, dog as I am, the great mercy that I ask of thee. Great as it is to me, it is only a crumb to thee. Grant it then, I beseech thee. Could she fail to have her request? impossible. When faith has a will, she always finds a way, and she will win the day when all things forebode defeat. Faith's pleas are singular, but let me add, faith's pleas are always sound, for after all, it is a very telling plea to urge that we are poor and needy. Is not that the main argument with mercy? Necessity is the very best plea with benevolence, either human or divine. Is not our need the best region, reason we can urge? If we would have a physician come quickly to a sick man, Sir, we say, it is no common case. He's on the point of death. Come to him. Come quickly. If we wanted our city firemen to rush to a fire, we should not say to them, Make haste, for it is only a small fire. No. On the contrary, we are that it is an old house full of combustible materials, and there, there are rumors of petroleum and gunpowder on the premises. Besides, it's near a timber yard. Hosts of wooden cottages are close by. Before long, we'll have half the city in a blaze. We put the case as bad as we can. Oh, for wisdom to be equally wise in pleading with God, to find arguments everywhere, but especially to find them in our necessities. They said two centuries ago that the trade of beggary was the easiest one to carry on, but it paid the worst. I'm not sure about the last at this time. Certainly the trade of begging with God is a hard one, and undoubtedly it pays the best of anything in the world. It is very, no it is very noteworthy that beggars with men have usually plenty of pleas on hand. When a man is hardly driven and starving, he can usually find a reason why he should ask aid of every likely person. 
Suppose it is a person to whom he is already under many obligations. Then the poor creature argues, I may safely ask of him again, for he knows me, and he's always been very kind. If he never asks of the person before, then he says, I've never worried him before. He cannot say he's already done all he can for me. I will make bold to begin with him. It's one of his own kin. He'll say, surely you will help me in my distress, for you're a relation. And if it's a stranger, he says, I've often found strangers kinder than my own blood. Help me, I entreat you. If he asks of the rich, he pleads that they will never miss what they give. If he begs of the poor, he urges that they know what want means, and he's sure they will sympathize with him in his great distress. Oh, that we were half as much on the alert to fill our mouths with arguments when we are before the Lord. How is it that we are not half awake and do not seem to have any spiritual senses aroused? May God grant that we learn the art of pleading with the eternal God, for in that shall rest our prevalence with him, through the merit of Jesus Christ. I must be brief on the next point. It is a soul urgent. Make haste unto me, O God. O Lord, make no tarrying. We may well be urgent with God, if as yet we are not saved, for our need is urgent. We are in constant peril, and the peril is of the most tremendous kind. O sinner, within an hour, within a minute... Thou mayest be where hope can never visit thee. Therefore cry, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Yours is not a case that can bear lingering. You have not time to procrastinate. Therefore be urgent, for your need is so. And remember, if you really are under a sense of need, and the Spirit of God is at work with you, you will and must be urgent. An ordinary sinner may be content to wait, but a quickened sinner wants mercy now. A dead sinner will lie quiet, but a living sinner cannot rest till pardon is sealed home to his soul. If you are urgent this morning, I'm glad of it, because your urgency, I trust, arises from the possession of spiritual life. When you cannot live longer without a Savior, the Savior will come to you, and you shall rejoice in Him. Brethren, Members of this church, as I have said on another point, the same truth holds good with you. God will come to bless you and come speedily when your sense of need becomes deep and urgent. Oh, how great is this church's need! We shall grow cold, unholy, and worldly. There will be no conversions. There will be no additions to our numbers. There will be diminutions. There will be divisions. There will be mischief of all kinds. Satan will rejoice, and Christ will be dishonored unless we obtain a larger measure of the Holy Spirit. Our need is urgent, and when we feel that need thoroughly, then we shall get the blessing which we want. Does any melancholy spirit say, We are in so bad a state that we cannot expect a large blessing? I reply, perhaps if we were worse, we should obtain it all the sooner. I do not mean if we were really so, but if we felt we were worse, we should be nearer the blessing. When we mourn that we are in an ill state, then we cry the more vehemently to God, and the blessing comes. God never refused to go with Gideon because he had not enough valiant men with him, but he paused because the people were too many. He brought them down from thousands to hundreds, and he diminished the hundreds before he gave them victory. When you feel that you must have God's presence, but that you do not deserve it, and when your consciousness of this lays you in the dust, then shall the blessing be vouchsafed. For my part, brethren and sisters, I desire to feel a spirit of urgency within my soul as I plead with God for the dew of his grace to descend upon this church. I am not bashful in this matter, for I have a license to pray. Before the Lord, I am a licensed beggar. Jesus has said, men always ought to pray and not to faint. You land on the shores of a foreign country with the greatest confidence when you carry a passport with you, and God has issued passports to his children, by which they come boldly to his mercy seat. He has invited you. He has encouraged you. He has bidden. Come to him, and he has promised that whatsoever ye ask in prayer, 
believing ye shall receive. Come then, come urgently, come with this plea, I am poor and needy, make no tarrying, O my God, and a blessing shall surely come, it will not tarry. God grant that we may see it, and give him the glory for it. I'm sorry to have been so brief, where I had need to have enlarged, but I must close with the fourth point. Here is an, another part of the art and mystery of prayer, the soul grasping God. She has pleaded, and she has been urgent, but now she comes to close quarters. She grasps the covenant angel with one hand, Thou art my help, and with the other, Thou art my deliverer. Well, those blessed mys, those blessed potent mys, the sweetness of the Bible lies in the possessive pronouns, and he who is taught to use them as a psalmist did shall come off a conqueror with the eternal God. Now, sinner, I pray, God, that thou mayest be helped to say this morning to the blessed of Christ of God, Thou art my help, my deliverer. Now, perhaps you mourn that you cannot get that length, but, poor soul, hast thou any other help? If thou hast, then thou canst not hold two helpers with the same hand. Oh no, say you, I have no help anywhere. I have no hope except in Christ. Well then, poor soul, since thy hand is empty, that empty hand was made on purpose to grasp thy Lord with. Lay hold on him. Say to him this day, Lord, I will hang on thee as poor lame Jacob did. I cannot help myself. I will cleave to thee. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Oh, it would be too bold, says one. But the Lord loves holy boldness in poor sinners. He would have you be bolder than you think of being. It is an unhallowed bashfulness that dares not trust a crucified Savior. He died on purpose to save such as thou art. Let him have his way with thee. And do thou trust him? O oh, saith one, but I am so unworthy. He came to seek and save the unworthy. He's not the savior of the self-righteous. He's the sinner's savior. Friend of sinners is his name. Unworthy one, lay hold on him. O oh, saith one, but I have no right. Well, since you have no right, your need shall be your claim. It is all the claim you want. Methinks I hear one say, Oh, it's too late for me to plead for grace. It cannot be. It is impossible. While you live and desire mercy, it is not too late to seek it. Notice the parable of the man who wanted three loaves. I will tell you what crossed my mind when I read it. The man went to his friend at midnight. It could not have been later. For if he had been a little later than midnight, it would have been early in the morning, and so not so late at all. It was midnight, and it could not be later. So, if it is downright midnight with your soul, yet be of good cheer. Jesus is an out-of-season Savior. Many of his servants are born out of due time. Any season is the right season to call upon the name of Jesus. Therefore, only do not let the devil tempt thee with the thought that it can be too late. Go to Jesus now. Go at once. And lay hold on the horns of the altar by the venturesome faith. And say, Sacrifice for sinners, thou art a sacrifice for me. Intercessor for the graceless, thou art an intercessor for me. Thou who distributest gifts to the rebellious, Distribute gifts for me, for a rebel I have been. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Such am I, Master. Let the power of thy death be seen in me to save my soul. O you that are saved, and therefore love Christ, I want you, dear brethren, as the saints of God, to practice this last part of my subject and be sure to lay hold upon God in prayer. Thou art my help and my deliverer. 
As a church, we throw ourselves upon the strength of God, and we can do nothing without Him. But we do not mean to be without Him. We will hold Him fast. Thou art my help and my deliverer. There was a boy at Athens, according to the old story, who used to boast that he ruled all Athens. And when they asked him how, he said, Why, I rule my mother, my mother rules my father, and my father rules the city. He who knows how to be master of prayer will rule the heart of Christ, and Christ can and will do all things for his people, for the Father has committed all things unto his hands. You can be omnipotent if you know how to pray, omnipotent in all things which glorify God. What does the word itself say? Let him lay hold of my strength. Prayer moves the arm that moves the world. Oh, for grace to grasp almighty love in this fashion. We want more holdfast prayer, more tugging and gripping and wrestling that saith, I will not let thee go. That picture of Jacob shall suffice for us to close with. The covenant angel is there, and Jacob wants a blessing from him. He seems to put him off, but no put-offs will do for Jacob. Then the angel endeavors to escape from him, and tugs and strives, so he may. But no effort shall make Jacob relax his grasp. At last the angel falls from ordinary wrestling to wounding him in the very seat of his strength. And Jacob will let his thigh go, and all his limbs go, but he will not let the angel go. The poor man's strength shrivels under the withering touch, but in his weakness he is still strong. He throws his arms about the mysterious man and holds him as in a death grip. Then the other says, Let me go, for the day breaketh. Mark, he did not shake him off. He only said, Let me go. The angel will do nothing to force him to relax his hold. He leaves that to his voluntary will. The valiant Jacob cries, No, I am set on it. I am resolved to win an answer to my prayer. I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Now when the church begins to pray, it may be at first the Lord will make as though he would have gone further. Luke 24, 28. And we may fear that no answer will be given. Hold on, dear brethren. Be steadfast, unmovable, notwithstanding all. By and by, it may be, there will come discouragements where we look for a flowing success. We shall find brethren hindering. Some will be slumbering and others sinning. Backsliders and impenitent souls will abound. Let us not be turned aside. Let us be all the more eager. And if it should so happen that we ourselves become distressed and dispirited and feel we never so weak as we are now, never mind, brethren, still hold on. For when the sinew is shrunk, the victory is near. Grasp with a tighter clutch than ever. Be this our resolution. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Remember, the longer the blessing is coming, the richer it will be when it arrives. That which is gained speedily by a single prayer is sometimes only a second-rate blessing. But that which is gained after many a desperate tug and many an awful struggle is a full-weighted and precious blessing. The children of importunity are always fair to look upon. The blessing which costs us the most prayer will be worth the most. Only let us be persevering in supplication, and we shall gain a broad, far-reaching benediction for ourselves, the churches, and the world. I wish it were in my power to stir you all to fervent prayer, but I must leave it with the great author of all true supplication, namely the Holy Spirit. May he work in us mightily for Jesus' sake. Amen.